Hello again, back time for some more video lectures for critical reasoning. This is the part two lecture for uh, extended argumentative uh, analysis, that module. Um, so we talked a lot about a lot of the really big picture stuff um, about doing this project of putting an argument into standard form and diagramming it. Um, the last lecture has like a lot of the foundations of the advice I have to give and the, the, um, the way the, the method is generally going to work. But we've got one big element to tackle this time that I was alluding to a lot the, the last time uh, in the first video. And that has to do with the enthematic arguments. So arguments um, that have missing premises or what the book calls suppressed premises. And those are very important to include, but they're also the trickiest to spot. Um, and I'm actually probably going to cheat a little bit here and go through some homework exercises with you as I talk through um, these uh, different skills. Just so you can see some illustrations and examples. There's some real classic ones uh, from the homework that are, are particularly tricky but do a really good job of, of showing you what you have to be uh, looking for and listening for. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to kind of spend a little bit more time working with this example from the equal exchange coffee argument and just let you to kind of see a fuller picture of everything that's going on. Let's just take a quick review and take stock of the different things we're going to be um, listening for as we're putting things together into standard form and diagram. So again, um, the, the extended argumentative reconstruction involves two components. It involves this putting an argument into standard form, which means um, using the conventions here with the line and therefore symbol, and separating out the different claims of the argument um, so we know what are the individual claims. And then we'll number them to keep track of which claims are which and do a diagram to indicate the structure. This is the art, this was uh, some example ones I had from last time. This is the one that we are working on for the equal exchange copy. Let's actually just label that so we remember what we're talking about. So the equal exchange copy argument. And so far, we've got an argument with this claim as a conclusion being supported by this claim, which if we go back to standard form, we know which one is which. So it's saying, the conclusion is that we ought to buy equal exchange coffee. That's what they're trying to convince us of. And a reason they gave us for that is that equal exchange coffee tastes good. So pretty straightforward here. That argument doesn't really have much more going on. There's not going to be multiple premises working together to make a reason for why we should believe the conclusion. But there are going to be more. There are going to be um, other um, uh, arguments that are offered for why we should think that this conclusion is true. And you know that's what we'll have to explore uh, next as we work through this. Um, but let's take a little stock here of what we're going for again. So in putting it into standard form and diagram, we're painting a picture of the argument. This means that what we're diagramming is really the ideas that are in, say, an essay like this one, an argumentative essay. And we're not really diagramming the essay itself. We don't care where the claims come from whether they're early or later in the paragraph, doesn't really matter. Um, the, what we're trying to recover is the logical space, the rational space of the argument that's being offered. Um, the English doesn't matter. English, all language is just a vehicle for the ideas, and it's the ideas that we want to capture. So that means we'll cut some stuff, uh, and we'll change some stuff, and we'll reword things to try to recover the logic of the argument. Um, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the portrait that we're painting with standard form and diagram. So that's what we're up to here. Uh, we already talked about how you can use explicit argument markers to help you in figuring out where there are inferences taking place in the passage um, to know when there's a conclusion, when there's a premise. Um, but we can't always count on them. But it's just it's nice to look for the argument markers first because those are unambiguous. Uh, and the general rule of thumb uh, that I brought up in the last lecture is we always want to figure out what's explicit first and track that and then go thinking or looking for what is implicit. That's going to be the procedure. So we're, we want to do this um, explicit stuff first, then implicit stuff later. That's going to be a general pattern here. Um, but we also are given, uh, when, once we do see what's explicitly there, there's a lot of room here to reword things um, as you see fit. And this is the artistic license thing I keep talking about. Um, when are you supposed to do it? There's no like um, definitive answer, procedure, or protocol for this. Um, you, this is where there's some creativity 
that's involved in argumentative reconstruction and where uh, robust listening, active listening, is really required here. Um, if you remember my main advice in terms of how to do this whole project is to do uh, standard form and diagram side by side. You're doing them at the same time. You're not doing one and then doing the other. Um, but you're always going to start with the conclusion and work your way backward. Instead of just scanning through an essay left to right, top to bottom, collecting all the claims, and then trying to figure out how the hell to put them all together into this thing, don't do it that way. Instead, look at the whole thing holistically. So when you're listening, look at the whole thing as uh, for giving context, for making judgment calls about what's happening. Um, I do have some particular advice here about the first step. I wanted to kind of go back and it, we're kind of doing a little review of the first video before we move forward. So if you're following my technique, which is different than how the book teaches it, I, it doesn't do the this explicitly, but I think it's always better to start with the conclusion, which may be who knows in the essay. You know, it could be beginning or end. Does you you never know for certain. Start with the conclusion and then trace these lines of support backwards. Once you've figured out what the conclusion claim is, then ask yourself, okay, what are the reasons that they're giving to defend it? And I always advise students to, before you start really pinning down what those claims are, like putting them in standard form, articulate them, just for yourself, think about what's the sort of appeal here. Maybe there's a, a general thing. Now, this one wasn't so hard, the fact that it tastes good. That's, you know, there's not much more to say about that. But as we get into the next um, argument that we're going to be looking that the author is giving for why you should buy Equal Exchange Coffee, it's going to get a little more complicated. And we might want to just get the basic idea first before we start um, getting into the details of how we actually want to word that claim. Um, so kind of kind of see the forest first and then focus on the trees. Um, get the general idea of what's happening and then you can figure out how to factor in the details. Don't let the details and capturing all the details uh, drive the whole procedure. Um, maybe you've heard the phrase, don't let the tail wag the dog. That's definitely important here. Um, the biggest thing is getting the conclusion. Now, how can you be sure that you've picked out the right claim as the conclusion. Well, for one thing, just like arguments can have hidden premises, sometimes an argument has a hidden conclusion. And it's that's a little more rare, um, but like uh, I was describing the paper project in the last video, um, every quarter, I, I usually, almost every quarter, I get at least one student who has written their argumentative essay and now they're going to the steps of analysis on it and they're like, uh, Tim, I think I screwed up because I don't see a conclusion. And it might be that it's implied, that it's like completely absent. But you can kind of, you can pick it up. You know, you can figure out where they're going with this, what they're trying, what they're trying to, con what the author is trying to convince you of, even if it's never stated explicitly. In this case, um, the claim that you should buy Equal Exchange Coffee is actually somewhat in here. I mean, it's it's worded right here. So have a cup of equal exchange coffee, remember so would be a conclusion marker here, um, and make a small farmer happy. So the, the idea is here. But if you're looking at the whole essay all together, you can kind of see how all the ideas are pointing in this direction. Now, so here's the piece of advice I've got for how to double check on whether you've got the conclusion directly, uh, whether you've captured the conclusion or not, because sometimes you can miss. You can get the conclusion that's a conclusion of, say, um, a sub-argument, like maybe you got that there was this inference taking place but didn't realize that this there's actually a deeper conclusion that they're going for. That can sometimes happen. Um, so you have to watch out for that. But here's a way you can kind of test. If you're looking at everything that they're talking about that's argumentative, and sometimes people go on tangents and talk about things that don't really matter, like, oh, this reminds me of one time this thing happened to me that's kind of like it. I mean, we, we do that all the time. And it may not have anything to do with the argument. Um, I think I talked about um, illustrations last, or maybe I didn't talk about illustrations. We're going to talk about illustrations, but sometimes we talk about things that don't do any argumentative work, and so they're not going to show up in our standard form and diagram because we're not diagramming the essay. We're diagramming the argument. So if, if there's something that's talked about in the essay that has no argumentative content, then we wouldn't include it. For example, this part right here. For more information about Equal Exchange or to order our line of gourmet, organic, and shade-grown coffee directly, call this number. This is not going to show up in our standard form ever because it has nothing to. It's not doing any argumentative work. It's not providing support for some other claim, and it's not a claim that's receiving support either. So we're just going to scrap it. We won't worry about it. Um, so, but.
but with everything that's argumentative, ask yourself if the conclusion that you have identified is really making all the other argumentative stuff relevant. Because if it's the ultimate conclusion, even if there's like multiple arguments and sub-arguments, everything's got to be going eventually to supporting that conclusion. Um, and if there are parts of the argument that are left hanging, like you're like, oh, I know this inference was taking place, but I don't know how to get that to fit in with this as the conclusion, then that's a sign that maybe you haven't identified the deepest conclusion. If your, uh, if your conclusion makes part of this argument irrelevant, then uh, we got a problem. So for example, let's say um, your conclusion, the conclusion you identified for the essay was something about um, what's happening to farmers and coffee. Let's say it was all about that. Um, just about what's happening to the small farmers and the large corporations, because they spent a lot of time talking about that. You might be thinking maybe that's the conclusion of this essay, that that's what it's all about. But if that was the case, then bringing up this argument about how their coffee tastes good would be irrelevant. There wouldn't be a place for that argument in your diagram, and that would be a sign that maybe something has gone wrong here. So uh, it'd be like one of these hanging arguments over here. So uh, that's, a, that's a way you can kind of double check on your conclusion to make sure that it's the ultimate conclusion of the essay. There's nothing grammatically, there's nothing um, in terms of the order in which claims appear. Uh, the topic sentence of a paragraph is not necessarily the conclusion. Um, you, there's no extra tricks here. Um, and believe me, students have tried to find tricks and they don't work. <laughs> At least they don't work every time. So you have to make a judgment call about it and there's no substitute here for just some good old-fashioned careful listening. Um, and the technique I described about looking for relevance. Um, that's, that's the best advice I've got there. But once you have uh, discovered what the conclusion is, now we're going to go looking for the supporting arguments. And uh, again, like with my advice, I recommend looking at the whole thing and just first getting a sense of what are the general appeals that the, um, that the author is going for here. So instead of the really like detailed claims, the facts that they're talking about or bringing up or something like that, just try to get like the, the sort of the gist of it like the an informal just in your head you know you don't have to, it's not like an extra exercise to write something down just be like okay what are they sort of appealing to to try to make their case so if we're looking at this essay there's a lot of details in this essay which makes it a good example for this technique um, about how to like get a handle on the general flow of things before so you don't get distracted by all the details um, there's some stuff going on here with large corporations there's some stuff going on with small farmers there's some stuff going on about helping farmers, about fair prices, some justice considerations here. So um, if we're going to try to start thinking about what are other reasons that they're trying to give us for, again, claim number one is you ought to buy equal exchange copy. What are the other reasons that they're giving us for that? Uh, what other argument might be going on here? I'd say before we're getting more detailed about it, there's something about how um, buying equal exchange coffee helps small farmers okay so um, and we there if we look at the rest of the essay they have a bunch of reasons why um, why buying e equal exchange coffee will help small farmers um, there's also this thing about large corporations and maybe you know this is a smaller little chunk of the essay so maybe we tackle this one first um, one reason that you might um, buy coffee from equal exchange uh, coffee, why you get your coffee through equal exchange, is so that you can support small farmers instead of large corporations. Do you remember when we were talking about, um, in the last module, about the annotations and talking about evaluative claims, we are saying sometimes uh, evaluative terms are harder to spot, like this lining the pocket sort of thing, and that there's a kind of um, implication that's involved with this idiom. Uh, of what's happening. But the basic idea, I don't know if you remember the exact problem, we talked about it a little bit, but um, the the gist of this is that rich corporations don't need your money while small, small farmers and poor are poor and probably could be a better use of your money. So maybe we want to try to capture some of that logic in how we put together um, the standard form diagram here. So let's get another claim in here. So we're going to have we're making a new argument, it's totally separate from the tasting good thing. These have, these arguments have nothing to do with each other, so we're making separate arrows. Um, and maybe we'd say um, 
one reason um, that you ought to buy equal exchange coffee is that you shouldn't buy coffee from large corporations. You know that if not you shouldn't buy if, if you shouldn't get your coffee from large corporations and where you can get it from, maybe equal exchange coffee. So maybe that's a reason that they're giving. And this actually feels pretty good to me. Again, um, I'm not going to be when I'm grading your exams and and we are talking about homework problems together. I'm not going to be getting super picky about the articulation. Um, the way we're talking, I'm talking about this whole thing is that you've got this artistic license. You've got to make judgment calls. You're going to word things in your own words, trying to capture the meaning of what the, you think the author is saying, of course, trying to make that as clear as possible. But you'll give different answers in different ways. Every student's going to kind of approach this slightly differently, and the wording will be slightly different. And I'm going to be very forgiving about that. Um, sometimes, though, there are some details that matter a lot for the kind of argument that's being made, and that if they were lost, we're, we're missing a big part of the picture. Like, if you uh, were painting that portrait, to use that metaphor again, you just left off the eyebrows. You're like, well, he did really good on everything else. That's awesome. But eyebrows are a pretty noticeable feature if they're missing. Um, there might be some details like that that are pretty important, or like getting the color of the eyes wrong or something. You know, so there, Sometimes the details matter. Now, if you don't, um, if the hair is like, you know, one inch longer than how you painted them, then that's not going to be a big deal. You're not going to sweat the small stuff. Um, but there, um, there's some stuff that will matter too. And it takes some practice uh, to really get a sense for what's important and what's not important, what really affects the argument or not. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a fuzzy thing. I, you're going to get sick of me talking about this, but a lot of informal logic is fuzzy like this. And it doesn't have the clear-cut answers that um, you might really want it to have. Um, but there's definitely ways in which we can increase our skill here at painting better portraits. So. Let's, let's go back to our argument here. I'm feeling pretty good about this. I think this captures the idea fairly well. You shouldn't buy coffee from large corporations. That seems to be part of what they're saying. And they give you a reason for it, too. They, there's a logic to why you shouldn't buy it from large corporations. If you buy it from large corporations, you make small farmers poor. And at the same time, that's what kind of the wow is doing, you're giving money to people who don't need it. So that's actually going to be some supporting argument. Uh, actually, we got kind of two different reasons. Wow, we got two arguments for uh, why you shouldn't buy from large corporations. And you notice I'm not really going in a line-by-line uh, -line sort of thing, but I am going to the text to look for the details. Um, but I'm like, okay, just what sort of a what's what's one of the things that they're appealing to? Um, and now let's go looking at the details and try to capture it. Um, this is definitely a major claim that they're making, but notice that I also, and this is something new that we haven't talked about yet, another part of the process when you're putting arguments in a standard form and diagram is you want to break up the chunks as much as possible. We could just take, I mean, and I've had students do this, doing this problem, I've, you could just copy and paste this whole thing right into a standard form claim. We could do that. It wouldn't be a very good diagram, though. It wouldn't be a very good standard form diagram portrait. Because by lump, there's a lot of going on in this one sentence. There's a lot of ideas here. There's a lot of claims. And we want to break that down as much as possible. We want to have this picture that shows us uh, how, what are all the ins and outs, that the, what are all the different reasons and arguments that are flying around. And especially we want to get a handle on this kind of uh, support, the shape of the support of how these claims uh, give reasons to believe that the other claims are true. So that's pretty important. So I think... Here we've got two different reasons that are being offered. I don't think that they're a part of the same argument. Because they're, they're not something we'd use this plus sign for because each of these stands independently. If they're saying you shouldn't buy coffee from large corporations because it makes small farmers poor, that's a good reason right there. And if you shouldn't buy coffee from large corporations because they don't need your money, then that's also a good reason. The, the, whether either one of those is a good reason ultimately or whether it stands up to criticism or argument, It'll happen on a different level. So, and again, you don't have to evaluate these arguments to diagram them, um, but it would be important to recognize that the logic of this appeal is separate from the logic of this appeal. That if this argument ends up being bad or this one ends up bad, it's not going to affect the other one necessarily. So, I think it would be good for us to keep these separate and let's, at the same time, let's put our arguments in here. So, 
Um, you shouldn't buy coffee from large corporations. Why? Um, large corporations don't need your money. Um, maybe we might say as much as um, as other sources of coffee. This might be a good detail. I, you notice uh, I didn't want to say they don't need your money flat because of course they need your money. <laughs> I mean, of course, any business needs money to operate, so that's definitely true. But maybe they don't need it as much as other sources of, co of co uh, the people who are providing coffee in other ways. Like, say, the small farmers. And I mean, if you want to put that detail in there too, uh, as much as the small farmers who, who are selling coffee through equal exchange, you can put that detail in too. I think at this point we've captured the main, the main idea and I'm not as concerned about sweating any more details there because um, that won't matter as much for the logic of that argument. The other thing that we had is that um, buying coffee from large corporations um, supports a system which keeps small farmers poor. Now. Here I'm using some of the language of the author. I, you know, I'm making some judgment calls about rephrasing things if I want to, but if I think the language um, that they used is fine, then then you can use it. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to put things in your own words. We just wanted this as clear as possible. The inadvertently part I think doesn't matter to the argument, so I dropped that and I made a judgment call to do that. I don't think it matters whether you're intentionally or unintentionally maintaining a system which keeps small farmers poor there's still the concern that buying coffee from large corporations keeps small farmers poor. Boom, right there. So that I, th I think that's adequate right there, that we've, we've captured the main ideas. Now, one more thing we need to do. Let's clean things up a little bit. Notice uh, four and five are both supporting three. So three is a conclusion, which means that we're going to have to um, put a little there four symbol in there and uh, we'll do here. I'll just do it this way. There we go. Now we've got another line. So we're drawing another conclusion here. Three. Then the only conventions here with standard form are just that you got to make sure that conclusions come below the premises that support them. So we've got that going on here, and we're great. Okay. So um, there's more to analyze in this essay. Um, certainly, we'd want to. And hey, let's do. Let's just do a little bit more. Let's just do a little bit more of this argument because I want to get into the next thing. There's another argument for why you should buy equal exchange coffee, and it's going to have something to do. I'm going to put another claim here. Again, I think this will just be a single claim. It's going to have something to do with how buying equal exchange coffee can support small farmers. Or we might use, well, yeah, let's say can help. That's the language they use. Let's keep it. Why not? Um, buy equal exchange coffee can help small farmers, and this is a reason to buy equal exchange coffee. Um, there's going to be some more going on here, especially as we get into the sub-arguments, but that's a general appeal. I could always go back and build in some more details to these claims if I feel like it deserves it. Uh, or if there's something I missed, like maybe there's another part in the essay where they, you know, clarify something in greater detail, and then I can go back and fix it. That's great. Um, but there's another, there's an argument going on there, and there's some more things to work out about this. But I'm going to stop here for a second, so I can demonstrate another thing that is a part of reconstructing arguments. So you know, we we've, we've talked about breaking things up, um, we've talked about diagramming. Um, but now we're going to get into this stuff about suppressed premises. And this is also going to integrate something else that we were annotating for when we were doing the annotations that I, I mentioned was going to be very important for these um, enthematic arguments, these arguments with suppressed premises. Um, when, uh, sometimes when we argue, when we give an argument, we leave out certain claims. Some things that maybe are so obvious they don't bear saying, or um, that we just sort of take for granted. Sometimes some assumptions that we're making that we may not recognize that the logic of our argument depends on those claims being true, 
but we never stated them explicitly when we made our argument. Now, we don't have to just say, uh, you know, we, we don't have to be like logic robots and be like, your argument fails because you failed to include this premise that's important to your argument. As stated, this argument sucks. I mean, we can be, we can be a little more um, understanding of how people are kind of taking some things for granted um, that they may not be, com you know, stating every single claim that's a part of their argument, but we can still get the gist of it. We can still follow the logic of it, but it would still be helpful to, if we're diagramming the argument, to identify what are those missing pieces, what are those um, parts that are crucial to making the argument work, but which were not explicitly stated. Especially when we're eventually, after we do this whole diagram thing, uh, using that to evaluate the argument to see whether it's a good argument or a bad one. If there are parts, if there are claims that the argument depends on that were never stated and they didn't show up in our diagram, then uh, they're not sort of noticed, they're not on the radar for being evaluated. And they may be very important. Uh, it may be very important to track that in order to evaluate them. Now, if you remember, there's there's two ways that arguments um, can fail. And so there's kind of two standards for evaluating what it takes to have a good argument. We want to have all true premises. And we want to have a good support relation. There, there's two ways that, that arguments can, that we're concerned about of, for anticipating evaluating them. Um, so even though right now, like I say, we're not uh, evaluating the arguments ultimately, that's not the point of what we're doing. Right now we're just trying to listen. We're still going to anticipate what would make for a good argument in order to figure out what we need to be listening for that might be left out. Okay, And this, this, is, this is where um, doing the argumentative reconstruction that's a listening activity is very similar to the Paul Grice stuff about conversational implication. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to study his theory. Because when we're trying to charitably reconstruct someone's argument, we're trying to, just like with conversational implication, we're looking for a way for it to make sense. We're like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how your linguistic behavior is sensible and rational, and so I'm going to interpret it to make that happen. Now, when the speech act or conversational act that we're engaged in is argumentation and debate, then part of my expectations are specific to that context. Specifically, I'm... I'm hoping that you make good arguments. Now you may not make good arguments. That you know that can happen in a debate. I'm open to that. But if I'm listening with charity, I'm trying to make your position as strong as possible before I attack it. I'm trying to look at it in the best possible light. I'm trying to put the best construction on what you're saying, and that's what's going to happen here. Now there's a balancing act. As we're thinking about implication, as we're looking for suppressed premises and hidden things that are going on, and doing all this rephrasing, we can fall off. To either side of, a, of the boat here. On the one hand, we could run the risk of not uh, interpreting enough, like taking things too literally, um, not listening more deeply, or doing more active creative listening. In that case, we're going to miss stuff. This is like if we leave out the suppressed premises, we're, we're just missing part of the argument. Um, so that's a problem. But we can go too far in the other direction too. If we read too much into what someone is saying, if we're doing too much work, of reconstructing their argument for them, then it's kind of like we're just arguing. We're This is the way I like to put it. We're putting words in their mouth that they don't really mean or intend to say. And that's the biggest danger on this side of it is kind of just fixing the arguments to have the person say what you want them to say instead of capturing what they are trying to say, what their objectives are. So that's a very important thing with listening. We <laughs> mess that up all the time. We hear what we want people to say rather than what they're actually saying. So we got to be careful about that. So there's there's a balancing act here. This is one of the calibration parts of this class that I keep talking about, um, and something that you may want to check in with me at the study groups or something like that, or phone or email or whatever, to make sure you're kind of looking at it right or get my pair of eyes on it and give you some advice about it, which I'm totally happy to do. So um, I'm going to actually bring up the diagrams again. So um, there's a couple ways that suppressed premises can show up. Uh, based on the two ways in which arguments can succeed or fail. Um, one, one thing could be to make sure that the premises that are offered are true. Remember, that was one, that's one thing that we need for a good argument. We need all true premises. So there might be some hidden premises backing up what someone has claimed. So they've made a claim, and the evidence for why this claim is acceptable or why we should believe it's true has been left unspoken. They didn't defend it. It would be like assuring would be a lot like this. Um, I This would be a kind of suppressed premise. It could be 
a part of the argument that they're taking for granted. Um, that's really a part of the logic of what's going on. But I never, never, ever, ever, ever want you to be concerned about this. Never. Don't worry about uh, things that are being taken for granted that are in the background that are justifying the claims that the person explicitly stated. You will, I will never want you to be trying to capture that kind of suppressed premise or an assumption that's being taken for granted. And the reason why is that, I mean, in the real world, if you're having a discussion with someone, I think it can be very, we certainly use this to try to understand where people are coming from. And we use that phrase all the time, like, wait, I'm trying to figure out where you're coming Oh, you believe these things, and that's why you're saying the things that you're saying, right? We do that constantly, too. We, we try to get inside a person's head to make sense of what they're saying. And that's fine. But even in the real world, that's a very risky enterprise. Trying to guess and speculate about what are a person's underlying reasons for why they believe what they believe can often get you into trouble. There's a lot of ways that things can go wrong there. Um, you might be familiar with some arguments supporting a certain conclusion, but maybe this person doesn't buy into that. Like, uh, oh, I know, this happened earlier this week. Um, let's say someone is arguing for um, a kind of uh, religious uh, ethic or morality. Uh, you might assume that their argument for behind why they think these values are appropriate are is some sort of maybe divine command theory that things are right and wrong based on whether God says that they're right and wrong something like that but maybe that person's like oh no I I don't think that these religious values are justified because of a divine command theory I think they're justified for these all sorts of these other moral arguments or maybe from pure reason or something like that um, maybe nothing that has to do with God um, so those things can that kind of situation can happen a lot there's lots of ways in which people um, try to defend they have different ways of defending the same position or the same claim um, maybe you've been like yeah I believe this but don't lump me in with those people because their reasons aren't aren't good ones I, I don't agree with their rationale but I do still support the position that they're supporting um, I think I've mentioned before in these video lectures that I think uh, American culture at this point is far more obsessed with what people believe than why they believe it. They're like, are you on our side or not? That's the main important thing. I don't care what your motives are. I just want to make sure you're on the right side, that kind of thing. And I think we have to be more careful than that when we're being critical reasoners, at the very least, to understand each other. So that we see what a person is saying and how they're representing their perspective and their beliefs accurately instead of putting words in their mouth that they're not necessarily saying. So that is the reason why I don't want you to be doing this. When you're reconstructing arguments for homework or on the exam or something like that, don't get into this kind of game of trying to guess at what are the reasons behind why the person is saying what they're saying or what are the assumptions they're taking for granted in that sense. I don't want you to do it there. Um, the other reason why I'm telling you you shouldn't do it ever is be if for at least the work in this class is that you will drive yourself insane. There, there's an endless amount of supporting arguments that you could be speculating about or what their reasons are for backing up their claims. So uh, for backing up why the premises of their argument are true. Now, there's some other. There's another standard, though. There's also the standard that for an argument to be a good argument, it has to have a good support relation. And this will give us some more guidance for how to interpret what someone might be leaving out to make sure that we are sort of capturing what they're really trying to say. And let's go. Let's do an easy example first. So, um, the the book talks about this by assessing an argument for validity. And I have this crucial, crucial note here in my lecture notes. I'm saying um, this is sloppy. You got to watch out for this. When in chapter five, the book in other places uses validity in that careful technical sense of deductive validity that we talked about in previous video lectures. Um, but in chapter five, they start using it in a sloppy way as being a good support relation. So you got to be careful about this. Um, what you're basically looking for is with the arguments that they've offered, is there a kind of a, is there like maybe, well what's going on here with my mouse? Oh, there, come on mouse, there we go. Is there like a gap? Is there a leap in logic from the premise to the conclusion? That's, that's another thing we might be worried about is, you know, okay, so they said that one was true because of two. Maybe that was really explicit. But you're like, that's kind of a stretch. There's a big gap in this support relation. I can imagine a lot of ways in which 
two could be true and one false. And that is validity. But remember that support relations aren't only evaluated in terms of validity, they can also be evaluated in terms of inductive strength. Most of the arguments that we make are never going to be deductively valid. The, most of the arguments are based on experience, and experience is never an absolute proof for anything. If you are skeptical about that, let me tell you about philosophical skepticism sometime, and I can show you that there's a logical gap there. Uh, even if it's a strong argument, there still is the logical gap of it not being valid. I think I might have talked about that a little bit in a previous lecture. But um, So when you hear the book talking about validity in Chapter 5, it really just means a good support relation. And a bad support relation would have a big gap in the reasoning, a big leap in logic from premise to conclusion. Okay, So that's what we want to first listen for. That's why we have to do a little bit of evaluation but as a part of listening to the argument. Because if we hear and find that there's a gap, if there's a problem here, then that leap in logic also gives us a shape for what might be a hidden premise that's a part of this argument. Another kind of hidden something, another, another claim that was never stated but is still there, that is needed to go along with the claim that was explicitly given to give a good argument, to sort of fill in the gap here, okay? To fill in the gap so that we've got a good support relation again. So when an argument, when you're looking at the argument that the person gave, and it's just obviously absurd, that there's like a huge gap in the reasoning, first ask yourself, as you're reconstructing the argument, is there something that they're taking for granted that they left unspoken? Sometimes the book uses uh, parentheses for this, so we might put in parentheses. That there's a um, there's a claim that was never spoken, but they're taking for granted that allows. It's I call this a helper premise. It's a premise that helps or allows for the explicit premise to provide a good reason for the conclusion. So think of it that that helper premise thing is a is a good way to think about this. So let's look at an easy example of this, uh, and that has to do with evaluative terms and normative arguments. So when I, we were talking about um, trying to uh, annotate for evaluative terms, I was saying that like these are frequently left out. We frequently don't own up to the, um, the premise, the, the moral principles that we're using or the ethical principles that we're using as a part of our argument, um, or um, we use language that uh, describes and evaluates, and so it might be ambiguous what's taking place here. And that happened with the equal exchange copy argument. So let's go back to one of the things that we were just capturing. Where is it? Here we go. So we're saying one reason why you ought to buy equal exchange coffee is that buying equal exchange coffee can help small farmers. Now, this is this. Think about this as like a premise here, six supporting one. Um, might sound a little familiar. Normative conclusion: you ought to buy equal exchange coffee. Premise: just descriptive. Buying equal exchange coffee will help small farmers. This might remind you about the hitting causes pain sort of example and why hitting is wrong sort of thing. You've got, um, the imagine someone who's like, okay, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, if I bought equal exchange coffee, it would help small farmers. But why should I help small farmers? Right? That there's, I know it helps, but why does that mean I should buy equal exchange coffee? So we can help uh, make clarify this. And it might this might seem a little inane, but it, it's worth it. I'll let you see that in a little bit here. Um, what, what's the logic of this? What we really need is another claim that says you ought to help small farmers. If you had seven plus six, now you've got a good reason for one. Where six all by itself, six all by itself, there's a gap in that in that uh, support relation. Six is not enough on its own to give you a good reason for one. But if we put six together, Oh, come on. Put six together with seven. Now we've got a good reason. Seven's a kind of helper. In fact, you know, this is a claim that's not explicitly stated in the essay, really. So, uh, you know, maybe we should put it in as the press premise. Honestly, I don't care whether you use the parentheticals or not. The main thing that matters is getting the claims into standard form, clearly, so we know which claims we're talking about and then putting in the right order in the diagram. That's the other thing, just the support relations being the, with the arrows in the right places. That's the most important stuff. Parenthetical thing might just be fun, and I'll keep using it in the lecture um, just to remind us of which claims we're 
unspoken and which ones were not. But I, that's not something I'll be grading you on on the exam or something like that. Um, okay, so we needed we needed this claim. We might put this one in parentheticals here. You'll notice that's also going on with some of these other arguments too. So, um, for example, claim number five here: buying coffee from large corporations supports a system which keeps small farmers poor. We might want to add in here that keeping small farmers poor is bad. Uh, maybe I won't put it in caps. <laughs> it's bad. Uh, remember, poor is one of these um, thick concepts. It's describing and it's evaluating. You know, we, when we were talking through this essay, we were saying, um, when I was like, poor, well, we should put E negative there. Why? Because when they're saying you're inadvertently maintaining a system which keeps small farmers poor, and that's a bad thing. Remember that? It was like, like a little aside. That's a bad thing. Negative evaluation. That felt really natural here, that they're bringing this up as a reason to buy equal exchange coffee and lo and behold that is what we are doing we are capturing that concept that idea that's there it's in the it's in the essay even if they didn't state it so explicitly as as we are putting it in our standard form it's there and we want to capture that now why I said I was gonna explain why this inane hair splitting is useful and important well here's why if this is the logic of the argument which I think it's pretty fair that it is you can see how there are two ways that someone could try to challenge the truth of the premises of this argument. They could try to take issue with six, or they could try to take issue with seven. They could try to say, look, buying equal exchange coffee cannot small help. Maybe it, maybe equal exchange coffee doesn't help small farmers. They're saying it does. Maybe it doesn't actually. So someone might try to dispute that. Or they could dispute this. Now that might be the less attractive one because it'd be like, who wants to argue uh, against that but it is another thing that could be challenged the normative principle that's behind it and the descriptive claim about what they're promising equal exchange coffee does buying equal exchange coffee what will that accomplish both of those are different ways that you could push on an argument the same way that um, pushing on that argument about why it's wrong to hit other people you'd be like hitting doesn't always cause pain that's not always true you could attack that premise or you'd be like I don't see why causing pain is wrong or maybe it's not always wrong, or something like that. So um, that, that we want to break down the claims of the argument so that we're in a position to be able to evaluate it in a, in a more exhaustive, careful, deliberate sort of way once we get past the stage of listening and onto the stage of evaluating, which is going to be happening after this first exam. But all of this, all the kind of listening work that we're doing, if it has any value, is so that we can understand the argument to evaluate it. So that's why all this stuff matters. Um, that's what's going on here, and that's why we're doing it. Now, I realized that there was a hanging thread from earlier in the lecture that I skipped, and I want to go back to it. I, th I think this has been a pretty good flow, and I'm definitely these are the most important things. But here are some other uh, little details that I should have mentioned along the way. That, and this is a smaller sort of issue. Um, but um, let's back up here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. They might be like, man, this is way back. Notice um, when you're putting things into standard form, and part, and this is kind of part of clarification, but it's it's working with explicit premises, is they, they talk about removing claims and repeated claims and stuff like that, and checking to see if assuring and guarding terms can be dropped. Okay, So I want to say a couple quick words about this. I mentioned illustrations earlier, too, and I never followed up on that. But... Um, it's important to remember that a lot of the language that's involved with arguing may not be doing any argumentative work. Um, there's lots of practices that we do that don't necessarily contribute uh, to providing a reason or a justification for a conclusion. So we want to be careful with that. For one thing, repeated claims, this is an easy thing we can clean up. Oftentimes, if you've got an extended per someone who's arguing in an extended sort of way, they're going to repeat the same claim over and over again. And and because of how English teachers have been telling us to write for a long time, you know, they tell you if you're going to make the same claim, like use different language, like mix it up, make your language a little your, your rhetoric a little more interesting and exciting. But when you're the reader who's trying to understand it, don't get fooled. If they're you if they're really making the same point just using different language, then you don't want to have a different premise in standard form for every single different version of the same claim. You can have the same claim show up in multiple places of an argument. It might be doing work here and here. 
that can, that kind of stuff can happen. So um, that's an easy one to be watching for. But you also want to remove irrelevant claims, claims whose truth has no bearing on the truth of the conclusion. It doesn't. It's not doing any argumentative work. Um, and I mentioned illustrations, and and a lot of case examples are like this. Maybe I did talk about this. I'm having weird deja vu. But I'll make the point really quickly if I'm repeat, just in case I'm repeating myself. Uh -huh. Irony. Um, when we use case examples, sometimes the case example is supposed to be evidence, and then it would need to be included in the standard form diagram presentation of the argument. But other times we use uh, a case example as just an illustration, just to explain what we mean. If I'm like, well, I use the moral principle uh, blah. And what I mean by that moral principle would be like, if I was in this situation, then this is what I would do. That example, as I just gave it, doesn't give you any reason why the moral principle is true. So it's not a supporting argument. It's not evidence. It just helps the reader get the idea of the claim that's actually being made. So you don't need to include it in the standard form and diagram. Once you got the idea, just word the idea in standard form. You know, Put that claim down in the clearest possible way that you can, and then you're done. Um, so that's why I, I wanted to say illustrations are a classic example of something that can usually be dropped. Uh, it's actually, I think, very rare that we use um, uh, a case example as actually evidence um, because uh, it's that, that's what we re refer to when we say anecdotal evidence. It's just like, I got a story one time this that happened to this dude, so it's true. And anecdotal evidence is very weak. I guess so we use anecdotal evidence. Yeah, people argue from anecdote quite a bit. But it's not a very good argument. Um, and maybe people use it as an argument, but really they should maybe stick to just using it as an illustration. Again, you got to make the judgment call. You're going to have to listen to what you think the speaker is intending. And that's, again, getting into things like conversational implication. What do you think the speaker is intending as the argument? Not ar what argument do you think they should be making, but what do you think they're making? If it's a bad argument, you want the diagram to have a bad argument. You want the, you want the diagram to depict a bad argument. Sometimes you can't save the argument with suppressed premises, with these helper premises. Sometimes it's just bad and there's no way you can make it good. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind here, that there's um, a limit to what you can reasonably do with charity in terms of uh, that boundary line of just putting a, the right construction on what the person is trying to say or when you start putting words in their mouth that they're not really saying. So we, we wouldn't want to do that. In a live conversation, you can always ask your conversational partner whether you are respecting their ideas properly. You know, and we do this all the time. We're like, okay, when you say that, do you mean this? And then you get them, you give them the opportunity to say, yep, or nope, and then and then you're good. Um, on the exam, you don't get to do that. Uh, you just kind of have to look at what you're being given and give it give it your best judgment call that you can. But again, we can look over this stuff more with the homework problems and, and stuff of that nature. Um, I do want to do some homework problems going over um, looking for suppressed premises or some really tricky cases sometimes uh, that I want to talk about that. And there, I also need to talk about, um, yeah, we need to talk about this. Um, so sometimes assuring and guarding terms can also be dropped uh, from the explicit argument. I've got some quick tips here, but again, you just have to listen and make a judgment call. But uh, here, are some, here are some general guidelines. Um, usually, appeals to authority when you're with assurances, when they're doing it by appealing to authority but not making a full-fledged argument from authority, you might want to include that. You might um, put a like little placeholder of that. It looks like they're starting out on trying to make an argument from authority here, but we still can't fill in all the details. So, but we might put it in the diagram, especially if we're using this in the real world, it might be like, okay, that seemed to be a part of what you wanted to argue. I want to hear more about that. Let's evaluate that. Let's see. Let's test that part of the case that you're making uh, to see whether there actually are authorities that say what you say they are and that you're reasoning with them in the proper way, that they have the right credentials and they're not guilty of bias and all the other things we care about when it comes to argument from authority. Um, so that can be retained, but things like commenting or expressing the strength of our belief can usually be dropped. Okay, so um, I was talking about that way of assuring is sort of like posturing. It's like, I'm so confident. I must have some good reasons for my confidence. But that kind of assurance doesn't give you anything to work with. Um, then you're into this really speculative guessing game of like, what the heck do they have in mind back there? I don't know. 
So that's why I, I, you can drop it. You're not going to put that into standard form. I don't want you messing around with suppressed premises there. Okay. When it comes to guarding, I think the biggest thing to, uh, that is a, a tip here or a trick, although it's not infallible and it doesn't work universally, but to think about um, what's going on with uh, guarding in the conclusion as being different from guarding with a premise. So um, here's some examples. I'll let you look that over in the lecture notes, but it boils down to this. Guarding in a conclusion is usually very important to keep because if we're going to evaluate the argument later, if the argument, if the, the conclusion is in its stronger version, if you drop the guarding term, then it's going to be harder to defend. And so there's a greater chance that the, the reasons that they've provided will not be adequate to defend the stronger version of the claim. So you probably need to keep the guarded claims in there. But when we're guarding premises, sometimes it works the same way, right? Because premises have to be defended as true too, so you might make a more modest premise. But in many cases, um, we might be guarding the premise only to um, sort of try to um, indicate that we think it should be allowed, that it should be a, considered a valid point, not in the sense of validity, but in the way that on the street people talk about, oh, it's a valid point, yes. It means it's like an acceptable point. Uh, actually, let's look at this one example I got. So here's an argument. It seems reasonable to think that Meredith is off of work by now, so she can give us a ride to the party. Here, we should drop the part about it seeming reasonable because the reasonableness of the belief that Meredith is off of work by now is not going to drive anybody to any parties. Okay, uh, It's the fact of Meredith being off of work by now that would give us a reason to think that she can give us a ride to the party. So that's a guarding term that could be dropped. There, that the, the guarding phrase is just there to try to indicate, like, isn't this a, an acceptable belief? So that's it. Um, so that could be dropped. So that's assuring and guarding. Again, those are two things we wanted to annotate because we wanted to watch it to see what's going on with those moves, those behaviors in an argument that was going to be relevant for how we're putting things into standard form and diagramming them. If you've been keeping score, there's one more thing we haven't talked about, and that's discounting. So um, I think what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to finish this lecture talking about discounting, and then I'm going to uh, get into... Um, some, maybe some more examples and doing some homework problems together uh, and maybe even finishing off this equal exchange coffee argument in the next lecture. I work because I'm pretty much getting to the end of all the content. Um, it's go, it goes a little faster when I'm just talking with myself. Hopefully it hasn't been too fast uh, of an explanation to not make sense. Um, but like I was kind of saying in my last video, please let me know. I mean, if there's a lot of questions popping up, then maybe I might make a supplemental video here. But this stuff is tough. And a lot of the toughness comes in the application of it. I'm giving you all the concepts, but the concepts won't decide everything for you. So even if you're listening to my lecture and you're like, yeah, it made sense. Way to go. Good job, Tim. You gave a great lecture. I understood everything that you said. You will still get to the homework and be like, okay. Hmm. Yeah. I understood those concepts, but hmm. Figuring out how to bring them and wield them and use them in this situation is a whole other can of worms. Um, so there can be a lot more stuff to talk about there. Uh, I've been trying to give some tips and tricks and the mindset that you should go into and calibrating, you know, not falling off one side of the boat or the other. But that's all theoretical. And at some point, you got to get your hands dirty and feel it out for yourself and try it out with some homework problems. So I think that um, probably, you know, your experience of this stuff will change once you start getting your hands dirty with the homework. And then reach out to me. We can, you know, come to the study sessions and we can we can start working out the other half of this whole project. But um, I don't have much more to say in terms of the conceptual stuff. Um, maybe I maybe I do. If you ask some questions, you might be able to pull some more stuff out of me. But there's only one more thing that we really need to talk about. Um, that was from our uh, from um, our annotations. Sorry, just blanked for a second. Okay, so discounting. How do we handle discounting? So let's remember again what discounting was. Discounting was anticipating a possible objections and 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 dismissing them. That's the discounting part, the dismissing of them without argument. Okay. Sometimes people in an argument might be responding to an objection too, but then it'll be pretty clear that there's argumentation happening. A lot of times discounting happens like blows by so fast. Like um, the ring is expensive but beautiful. Right. That's a that I love that example. And let's look at what we would do to handle. Uh, let's say I was like diagram that, put the argument, put it in standard form. And uh, and um, and diagram it. And so I think I love this example because 
in just that one little sentence. The ring is expensive, but beautiful. There's actually a whole host of claims. There's ideas packed in there so efficiently with language. And it's our job to listen carefully and unpack all the claims and diagram it so we can get a clearer picture of what's going on. Because sometimes language is too elegant. It, it's deceptively elegant uh, in being able to pack so much information in so efficiently. So we want to be careful about that. So let's do, uh, let's make a new thing here. Uh, I will save this. Why not? Um, onto my desktop. Let's just save that. Okay, and let's got, let's work with the new one. So we have this example. Here's a quote you might get. The ring is expensive, but beautiful. Okay, and I want you to put it in standard form and diagram it. So um, there's a lot of implication going on here too, but let's try to figure out um, what would be sort of like the conclusion. Again, starting with the start at the bottom. Start with the conclusion, and then um, whoops, and then let's trace the line of support back. Right. So we'll go that way. So what might be the conclusion here? So we've got our little therefore symbol. Actually, I'll make that better. So we've got claim number one. Oops. Oh, dang it. There, that's better. Bigger. Uh, the ring is expensive but beautiful. What are they trying to maybe justify here? This might be a case of a suppressed conclusion, right? A conclusion that's left unspoken. But I think we can get the idea. Based on context here, with uh, the, well, why would these claims be relevant? Again, using the Gricean maxim of relevant, relevance. A likely conclusion here is that, um, and I won't give you anything that requires this much implication on the exam, FYI, but I think the plausible story here is that the conclusion is uh, we should buy the ring. I think that's the conclusion. I think that's it, people. Um, so that's a conclusion. And, you know, while we're at it, let's get our little therefore symbol, boom, little tri-dot there. And what is their reason? Why do they think we should buy the ring? Because the ring is beautiful. Boom. Seems to be the logic of the argument. Anything more? Do we need to add something to that? Mm, that's probably good enough. I don't see any big gap in the support relation here. Um, maybe beautiful is good or something. We could we could pare that down if we want to. But right now we're focusing on discounting. So let's think about that. Remember that we, if we were doing the annotation here, we would be boom. This here is a val uh, is discounting. That's a discounting move. We might also put that expensive. That's e negative. And beautiful. Oh, that is e positive. So we might put that evaluative claim in our standard form if we were being careful putting suppressed premises in there. Um, <clears throat> but how are we going to deal with this? They made the claim that the ring was expensive, but we can't just drop in the ring is expensive. This doesn't make any sense. That's supposed to be a reason for the conclusion? No, that's exactly not what they would say. So we can't do that. That claim doesn't belong in this argument, but there still is some support that's being given to the conclusion. How are we going to handle that? Well, think about it like this. There's a couple ways that you can support a conclusion. You can give a positive reason why the conclusion should be accepted, or you could um, undermine an objection against it, and that's what's happening here. So the this is kind of conversationally implied, but if we want to make it ex explicit, I recommend this wording. If you've got some discounting going on, there is a claim, there is an argument, and it's an argument that looks like this. The objection that dot 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 and in this case what's the objection the objection that we shouldn't buy the ring because it is expensive fails this is the sorry I'm gonna fix this in a second there we go um, this format the objection that blah 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 fails that's my advice for how to word uh, these discounting arguments okay so that claim, I mean, you can kind of think about it intuitively here. If that claim is true, then that provides some support for the conclusion. If this objection fails, boom, that's another reason why we should buy the ring. Great, more support for buying the ring. Sweet. Okay? Um, that's how you handle discounting. 
This is also how you'll handle someone responding to an objection. They're making this claim. They're making a claim that the objection fails. Now, if it's not discounting, because discounting is when you don't give any support. You just say it fails, you're dismissing it, that right? And that you're just leaving it like that. If you gave if the person gave a reason why the uh, objection that it's expensive fails, then that would be a supporting argument. So then you'd put another little arrow here. And whatever is the whatever is the um, the defense or the um, the response to the objection, whatever those claims are, they would make an argument here that then would point to defending this as the conclusion. What's the reason why we should think the objection fails? Well, because this is my response. So that's the intuitive way that you can handle discounting. Um, use my kind of format there. It, it'll work every time. That's this is a case where you can really just use that model for how to handle discounting. Sometimes you have to get a, you have to use some conversational implication, keep your listening ears open, some active listening here to figure out what is the objection that's being defended against. But once you got that, then then you you can articulate that and you're off to the races using my format. So um, that's how to handle discounting. It's a tricky case. Uh, every quarter, students are kind of struggling with that. So that's the way to deal with it. So that's my advice uh, on discounting. And then next time we'll run some more problems together and you can see some more stuff in practice. So until then, bye bye.